Okay, folks, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome to this class on investing. Uh, for some of you, it's going to be a new experience. For some of you, you've been through this before. Uh, this is no free dinner. If you came here to look for food, you're going to be starving by the end of the night. Okay? But how many people have been to the free dinners? You know what I mean by that? Yeah. So, of course, they're not free, right? They're an advertising pitch by financial people to try to pitch something, generally an annuity, that they're going to make a lot of money on, right? So, this class is all about education. Not here to sell you anything. Uh, uh, what I am really trying to do is sell you on you, on your ability to take control of your money, which includes your investing, and that also includes your life. Because what I know from experience is if you learn this information, if you learn how to manage it effectively, you can change the course of your life. So Jane Bryan Quinn there, she's a personal finance writer. She's been doing this for decades. And that quote, it's the truth. So I would ask you never to forget that quote. Uh, Half of this presentation today is telling you what not to do. And the other part's gonna start to kind of get into the point of what to do. And over the next eight weeks, we're gonna go into depth on this subject. Tonight's kind of this big overview. So don't worry if some of it is a little bit confusing or new, it takes time. Keep adding to what you know, and as you go along, it'll make more and more sense. Let's get started. So who am I again? I educate, I coach people. I don't get paid to sell. You're gonna hear me talk about Vanguard a lot tonight. Vanguard doesn't pay me. I have no affiliation with Vanguard whatsoever. If somebody else were doing it better than Vanguard, I'd recommend them. I'm not just some guy in a suit, right? So we think of financial advisors, we think of people in suits and they look all pretty and blah. Yeah, I'm the guy warning you about the guys in the suits, okay? So it's the idea that we need to be a little more mindful and even more skeptical when it comes to people trying to help us with our money. Basically, I want you to find the truth amongst a whole lot of garbage out there because Almost everything out there is crap. And some of you may know that, but what I would also ask you to be is don't be cynical. It's okay to be skeptical, but to be cynical meaning nothing is good out. Well, that's not correct. Thanks to a guy by the name of John Bogle, we have some very good options out there for you to invest in so you can grow your money over time. So you can have a successful retirement, or whatever the case may be with that money that you've invested, that hard-earned money. So before investing, you know, if somebody has interest rate loans that 8, 9, 10, 20%, that's where a savings should be going. It shouldn't be going to investments. If, if somebody's got a credit card bill and it's due and they're paying 18% on it, put it toward that. That's a guaranteed 18%. That's just crazy, right? So if you can earn any kind of guaranteed rate of seven, eight, 10, 12%, go get that. So when I'm talking about investing, I'm talking about investing because you have loans, if you have them, at a very low interest rate, below 6%. And of course, always setting aside money for emergencies, having a savings account as you have this money over here in your long-term bucket, growing for you. Piece that people don't talk about enough, and savings. Uh, I can teach pretty much anyone how to be a great investor. Believe me, it's not that hard, I promise you. But if you don't save enough, you don't build enough capital, you're only gonna be able to make so much money off your investments, even if you're great at it, if you're not saving enough money. So it's a combination of things learning how to save a good chunk of your money and then investing it wisely. That's what this is all about. And the other piece is learning from independent sources. So a list of independent sources right there. I brought up books for many of these people tonight. Feel free to, to look at them after class. So 
These are not only experts, but they're experts who will educate you without selling you. And that is huge. So when I started to learn about money, I was learning from the wrong sources. I made many mistakes. And I even still, as I started to gather knowledge, I still read from a lot of wrong sources. One of my goals is to get you straight to the right people right away. Don't waste your time learning from other people doing things that are not in your best interest. The other piece that I would mention, when I read my first book on money, which this is it, Wealth Without Risk by Charles Gibbons, I was 25 years old, and you know, most of it went over my head. I didn't know what the hell I was reading. But I got one big message in there, and that was that I could do this. And that's a message I want you to walk away tonight with, which is you're in control. You can become your own financial expert. That's what this is about. And if you really feel like you need help, later in the weeks, I will guide you toward the people who can help you at a reasonable cost. In the meantime, start to believe in yourself. Start to believe that you can become your own financial expert as you gradually add information to what you know. It's not so much having to know it all right now, it's knowing who to learn from and then keep going. Because here's what I know, I've been on this journey for 30 years. They all say about the same thing. The smart people, they know. We know from decades of research what makes a good investor. And we know what makes a bad investor. So again, over the next eight weeks, I'll be laying that case for you. I will try to help you identify the right path for you. So understand human behavior. So thing called recency bias. We really wanna know about who we are as human beings. So recency bias basically says, when something happens, it has a real effect on us. And we tend to think it's gonna keep happening. Stock market goes down, oh my God, it's gonna go down. You're gonna, gonna keep going, uh, no, it's gonna go back up. Or the stock market's zooming up, oh my God, it's just gonna keep, no, it's gonna come back down. So understanding this is important as an individual to say, okay, I can get a little overheated because of what just happened. That's normal. Don't beat yourself up about it, but acknowledge it. Acknowledge that you have emotions that can play tricks on you. Same with reversion to the mean. So that's this idea that what goes up will come down, what goes down will come up. Every dog has its day. Every asset class is gonna do well in some periods and not so well in others. That's why we own multiple asset classes within a portfolio. So understanding reversion to the mean also helps you understand that whatever is down or up will generally come back to its historical average over time. And we'll talk about those numbers and averages and, and what you might expect from a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds and maybe real estate as well. Go right ahead, sir. Alpha. So this generally pertains more to men than women. What do I mean by that? Well, women, don't snicker at this, but there are a few men out there who think they're just a little bit smarter than everybody else. I don't know if you know any men like that, but they, they exist. And it's this idea that, you know what? I know better. I'm smart enough to beat the market. Well, what you're really saying is you're smarter than millions of traders, including a guy by the name of Warren Buffett. So let me help you out. That's delusional. You and I are not smarter than the market, and it's okay. But what I want to do is acknowledge that and say, hey, I don't have to beat the market, I just have to be the market. Because if you get market returns on your money over time, you're gonna do quite well. You're gonna be one of the best investors in the world by simply capturing market returns. So not chasing alpha is to take back that ego and realize I don't have to be the smartest person in the room. I simply need to own markets that are full of some of the smartest people in the world, including Warren Buffett. 
and Pompeo lost the version. Tough one. So it's this idea that we as individuals, we react worse when we lose money versus winning money. So you, you make $5,000 in the market, it feels good. Your account goes down $5,000, like, oh my God. We tend to lose it. We tend to think that that's just really a lot worse than what we did by making $5,000. So loss aversion is simply our emotions playing tricks on us, making bad feel even worse. So be aware of these. Be aware how they, how they cause emotion to bubble up because a really good investor harnesses their emotions. Emotions are not part of the decision-making process. Emotions can hurt you when it comes to investing your money. So the media, just ignore almost everything you see and you hear. I mean, to say it's crap is being nice. People are on television to spout off opinions, to tell you about the future. They're on the internet. They have to write articles. They have to write a lot of articles. They got to put a lot of people on television because they have 24 seven news. That doesn't make them right. Doesn't make them experts. More times than not, they're dead wrong because they're trying to predict something that's unknown. Nobody, and I mean nobody, knows the future of markets, including a guy by the name of Warren Buffett, and he'd tell you that. So when you see somebody on television or some internet article saying, well, the market, yeah, ignore them. TV doesn't make you an expert. Having opinions, it means nothing. Sensationalism sells. So for example, if anybody ever watched John Bogle go on a television show, Business Network, they would ask him the same questions, he would give the same answers. He was not very exciting. Invest in an assortment of low cost index funds. What's your next question? Well, what about invest in an assortment? Yeah, in other words, it is simple. This whole issue is simple. People try to complicate it and partially try to complicate it because there's a lot of money to be made if they can figure out ways to access your funds. So be aware of that. So what's behind the curtain? So the financial services industry and all those companies out there that work at trying to get your money, well, they do a great amount of marketing, right? They spend millions and millions and millions of dollars trying to market their services, who they are, to try to convince you that you should give them your money. Well, ever thought who's paying for that marketing? Yeah, their clients. Their clients pay for that marketing. And they pay for that marketing through higher fees within their accounts. They also do a lot of predicting. There's a whole lot of financial experts out there who really think that they know what sector of the economy to be in, what country to be in, what asset class to be in, and what not to be in. Because they're so smart, they can see the future. Well, they're wrong, but again, that ego can drive a lot of people. They do a lot of selling, right? They have to sell you on themselves. They gotta sell you on the idea that somehow they know better. They're gonna make you money if you just give them your money and they do a whole lot of failing, a whole lot of failing. And we know this, right? This isn't my personal opinion. We know this from a, a litany of research. And here's one. So I'll help you read this in real simple terms. The number you see, that's how many managed funds failed to beat their benchmark index. So for example, that very first one, large cap stock. Over this 15 year time period, 84% of managed funds, people who are trying to predict markets, pick the right stocks, get out of the wrong ones, 84% of them fail to beat the market. Or you can turn that around, 16% actually did beat it. Think about those odds. You've got 96, 95, 64, average about 87%. Now who would play that game? Who would knowingly play a game where the chance of you succeeding is so very small? 
Well, I would tell you people who just don't know. They don't know what they don't know. And by the way, I played that game because I didn't know. But once you become educated, you start to see the fallacy of chasing after managed funds and people who are trying to buy the right stuff and avoid the wrong stuff. They end up costing you more and you end up with less. It is that simple. They cost you more, so you get less. That is not a good equation for your bottom line. Avoid fee-based financial advisors. So what does that mean? Well, about 90 some percent of the financial advisors out there are fee-based. They're basically glorified salespeople in many cases. It's a show. They wear nice clothing, they drive nice vehicles, they work in nice offices, and they have very pretty presentations to convince you that they are really the smartest person in the room. Don't be swayed by credentials, right? There's a lot of people in the industry who have a lot of credentials. And by the way, I'm talking about people doing everything legal. I'm talking about anybody being a crook. We'll talk about the crooks later. We're talking about legalizing, taking your money and giving you less. And you might think, well, Finland, do you have some? No, I don't, I don't have any issue with anybody out there. I'm sure some of them are very nice people. I'm sure they're family people. I'm sure they go to your church. I'm sure they play ball with your children. I bet they do a lot of good things for the community. But you don't need them in your life because they're going to take your money and put it in their retirement account. And again, not my opinion, we know this. We know this from a litany of research. They're not experts. Again, most fee-based financial advisors, so fee-based, their job is to pull in your money and then sell your products. And they're getting paid behind the scenes and you don't even know it. You have no idea what they're getting paid and you feel like, well, no, I'm not paying. Oh God, you're paying. In other words, there are people who think they're not paying for their financial experts. They're actually paying a great deal. It's just that fees are built into the products. See, the industry learned long ago. They, they realized that people don't like getting a bill. So let's see now. Oh, we just won't give them one. And they'll feel like they're getting a hell of a deal. And that's what happens. So the fees are baked into the product. You end up thinking, this isn't costing me anything. And the truth is, it's costing you a great deal of money. So be aware of that. Be aware of how the industry works. And we're going to be talking about that in more detail with the weeks to come. But the bottom line, products are built for them. The financial services industry is created to make money for the financial services industry. Just acknowledge that and say, okay, how can I maneuver around all that cost so my returns are higher over time so I can create some degree of wealth for myself and my loved ones instead of making somebody else rich at my expense. Again, thanks to a guy by the name of John Bogle, you and I can do that with those low cost index funds, which we'll be talking about plenty in the coming weeks. Avoid individual stocks and bonds. So there are people who always try to get in with individual stocks, sometimes individual bonds. I get it, right? You, it, you think to yourself, I have people come to me, oh, what do you think about Lyft? What do you think about uh, you know, the, the new marijuana stocks? What do you think about, see, you and I have this perception that we know something that the market doesn't know. <laughs> that is delusional, okay? Whatever you and I know, the market that's already traded on the information that you and I know, they know a whole lot more, a whole, whole lot more. So when you're trading, when you're buying or selling an individual security like an individual stock, you're buying from somebody who has a vast amount of information that you don't have and will never have. Half the time, maybe, you're buying from professionals or machines, a machine that knows exactly the right time to buy or sell from you. So we as individuals have no business buying individual securities because we're at a distinct disadvantage by doing that. And again, part of this is ego. Just let it go. Let go of the ego that says, I know something that the market does. No, you don't. I don't know it, and you don't know it. 
That price has already been affected. The price of that individual security that you think you want to buy, whatever the business may be, has already been affected by other traders based on all kinds of information, including cheaters, insider traders, people who trade on information that's not even available in public markets. You're getting what's left after that. Don't play that game. Because you are last to know. What you want to focus on is broad diversification. Don't own two, three, four, five, six individual stocks. Own thousands of individual stocks and or bonds. For example, Total Stock Market Index Fund at Vanguard owns the entire publicly traded U.S. economy. Almost 3,700 individual businesses. That is vast diversification. That reduces your risk. That gives you a chance to capture the market return. And that's what you want, the market return. Here's an example. It's a very good period of time. I like to use it. 20 years. It covers the 90s and then the first decade of this century. So the 90s, for anybody who's not aware, it was an amazing decade for stock. The first decade, it was terrible. Stocks actually went down in value at the end of the decade. So two good periods and bonds were somewhere in between there. So what you see here, look at the S&P 500. That's a market of basically 75% of the US market, large companies. 8.2, that's what the market average was over that 20 year time, pretty good. But the average investor only made 3.17, not even half. Now, how? Well different reasons. One, the industry, they pulled their chunk from the average individual investor. Part of it is us, our emotions, thinking that we can time the market, that we can get in, we can get out. So we can hurt ourselves and the industry can certainly take a chunk away as well. Bond market, you see how badly the average individual bond investor did as well compared to the bond market return. So just get those returns. Get 8.2 in stocks, get 7.01 in bonds. You're gonna be so far ahead of the average investor. So avoiding in life insurance products. So uh, investing in life insurance products is one of the very worst ways to invest your money, just in case nobody ever told you that. So we're talking about annuities, we're talking about cash value life insurance, those things are loaded with fees, and you never get a bill, but they're there, and they increase the cost of the product. So for example, some guy sells, an insurance agent sells an annuity, makes it sound really good, but he's getting a six, seven, eight, maybe 10% commission by selling you that annuity. Well, who's paying that commission? You think the insurance companies? No, they're not paying that commission. Is he paying it himself? No. You are. You're paying it with those internal fees of that product. So, good rule of thumb. If you're ever buying something, you want to know exactly what you're buying. And if you can't tell, you probably should run away. Separate life insurance from investments. It's very easy. Never use life insurance as an investment product. It's one of the most inefficient ways to grow your money over time. Avoid those annuities, avoid cash value, whole life policies. And again, you spend time with an insurance agent, he's gonna make it sound really good. That's what they do. They are good salespeople. You gotta see through the promised guarantees. It's an easy way for a lot of insurance products to be sold. We guarantee you this 4% return. We guarantee you not to lose money and then you can make a certain amount on the upside. It's called indexed annuities. They are crap by a different name. You see, what happens is, people like us, we become a little more educated on the topic. And the insurance industry goes, oh shit. But, oh, let's create something else. They won't know about that. And then it goes again. And periodically, that's exactly what happens. And then they train their salespeople to get out there and pitch those products. And if you're a good salesman, you're probably able to pitch quite a few of those products. Basically fund 
your retirement, not his. That's the key. It's the key throughout this whole process. So, uh, a lot of stuff about what not to do. Not to worry. We'll be spending plenty of time of what to do. So identify your horizon, all this stuff. It's pretty basic. This shouldn't be new to too many people. When you talk about time horizon, the only mistake some people make, they think a time horizon is like to retirement. Uh, no, time horizons to death or maybe beyond. So you're trying to project how long will you need money? And when I say beyond death, well, you might be investing for your heirs, for your children, grandchildren, whatever. But you want to be making sure that you at least have enough money for the day when you're no longer around. Because if you just have enough money to get to retirement, you could be in retirement 20, 30 years, maybe more. We need to have enough money to take us right through retirement. Risk tolerance. It's this idea that, you know, okay, I can handle it when the stock market goes down. Yeah, no problem. You know, I, I deal with this often. Right? I, I talk to people about it. Oh, yeah, no problem, Finley. And then the market goes down. Finley, what the hell? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll call up the market, tell them to do better, right? Can't do that. So it's real. And, I, you know, again, it, loss aversion. It's very natural that you sign into your account and you see the value has gone down, right? Markets go down. That's okay, not the end of the world, especially when you're putting money in, it can actually be a good thing because now stock just got cheaper as you buy more. But nonetheless, that's just the value. As long as you don't sell, guess what? It will come back. Sometimes it comes back quickly, sometimes it comes back slowly over time, but it comes back. So to be able to weather the storms of negative returns on your portfolio, that's what makes a great investor. So when it goes down, the wise and informed investor says, well, of course it went down. Markets go down. And if you go through that process enough times, you don't lose much sleep over it. And so your risk tolerance, what I would tell you is, it raises with your education on the topic. The more you understand how this game is played and played well, the higher risk tolerance can be. Your goals, right? What is that money for? Sometimes... <laughs> I, I kind of think that's how I got started. You know, my dad said, you need to save your money. So that's what I did. I didn't know what for. He never told me what I was supposed to save it for. Uh, I don't know if I knew that at the beginning, but what are your goals? What is this money for? Is it to buy a home? Is it to retire? Is it for kids? Educate? What is it for? Right? So for me, it was financial freedom. I wanted the freedom to live life on my terms as someone else. That's what I wanted. And that's, a big part of what this can do for someone, but identifying goals helps drive behaviors. You can develop the right habits by actually figuring out what's really important to you and why you're doing what you're doing. Answer the why. And then of course taxes. You're always considering taxes with every decision you make, but as the old term goes, don't let the tail wag the dog. You shouldn't be making decisions simply because of taxes. You consider taxes as you make each decision. We'll talk about that more in the weeks to come. So buy income producing assets. It's pretty simple. If it doesn't produce income, don't buy it. That's it. So that means stocks, bonds, real estate. They produce income. They'll produce interest. They'll produce dividends, earnings growth. Always keep an eye on cost. Always, no matter what asset class you're trying to own, make sure you own it at the lowest possible cost. Because that's available out there. And, and by the way, you know, there are no special markets per se. In other words, the same markets that your financial advisor or some other company wants to invest in, you have the opportunity to invest in them too. Public markets are all open for anybody you just want to find the right investments at the lowest possible cost. And that means avoiding speculation. No Bitcoin, no gold, no silver. They produce no income whatsoever. It's a fool's errand. Basically, it's buying something and hoping some sucker in the future pays more than you did. That's what that's about. It's a game that is played, especially 
when stock markets are going down. And if you actually pay close attention, when markets are down, you'll see these commercials up on television and on the internet. All of a sudden, they're telling you about how, how safe gold is. Well, gold is not safe, neither is silver, neither is Bitcoin. It's a loser's game, don't play it. Allocate and own the world. So owning and identifying the right asset allocation. So we're gonna be talking about asset allocation quite a bit. It's a huge issue. You want to know the right asset allocation for you. Identify that. And I know some of you are thinking, dude, I don't even know what the hell that means. Well, we're gonna be talking about it. How much to own in stocks and bonds and real estate and cash? What is right for you and or your spouse? So you may have an individual portfolio, you may have a family portfolio. And understand modern portfolio theory and the efficient market hypothesis. So let's start with the efficient market hypothesis. I've already talked about it. It's the idea that whatever you know, the market's known for quite some time. So the market is efficient, doesn't make it right. Matter of fact, the market is not right much of the time. But it's efficient in the sense that it owns information that you and I don't own. The market has a, a great deal of information they're trading on, and it's efficient in that way. And as soon as new information comes in, boom, it's traded on. I mean, in moments of time, something that you and I are not capable of doing. So acknowledge the efficient market hypothesis. Again, not saying the market is right, saying the market is capturing all information and trading on that quickly. Then modern portfolio theory is simply this idea that you could pull different asset classes together. Large US stocks, small US stocks, bonds, international stocks, real estate, put them together in a portfolio, and even though something is highly risky, it can work in a negative correlation with another asset class. So when something's going down, something else is going up. And by pulling all them in together, what you end up with is less volatility. The lows are not as low within a portfolio because you own multiple asset classes. Now this is when somebody might say, well, Finley, I just want to own the right ones. Well, shit, so do I. So we can all look back in time and say, oh, I wish I'd have owned that right there. Yeah, I can do that, you can do that. What we don't know is the future. And what asset class is gonna do better in one time period over another. Every dog has its day. So you don't try to guess which asset class is gonna do better, you own all asset classes at the lowest possible cost. And that means buying no load index mutual funds. So when Jane Bryan Quinn was talking about that 0.1%, that's it, that's it. No load, no commission, no middleman. You're not paying some salesman a commission to invest your money. And then an index mutual fund. So a mutual fund with pooled assets could be billions of dollars. And then an index where it tracks a benchmark like the S&P 500. 500 largest companies in the world, you own them all. You don't try to pick winners and losers. You just own it and that's it. There's no buying and selling and that means the cost can go way, way down. Caveat, make sure you own the right index funds. There are expensive index funds out there. There are load index funds out there. So you have to be vigilant because the industry, they're pretty good at playing games to try to get as much of your money as they can. And then you rebalance on occasion. Something we'll talk about. So rebalance. You, your stocks, maybe, more times than not, they get out of whack. You have more stocks than you want. Use me as an example. I'm an 80-20 guy. Been an 80-20 guy forever. 80% of my portfolio is in stocks, U.S., international. 20% is in bonds and cash. If it gets to 90% stocks, that's my 10% threshold, I will go in and I'll sell stocks because they've gone up so much within my retirement account, so there's no tax consequences, and I'll sell back to an 80% stock allocation, buying bonds and cash. So, yes, sir? So, it's only stocks, it's only one. Is that accurate? That is accurate. So, you pick one percent asset, it's 
That is correct. And you're generally, by the way, you're selling your winners and you're buying your losers. Say that again, selling winners, buying losers. That can be hard, right? It's hard to say, why in the hell do I wanna buy that? Because that's been going down. I don't wanna keep owning and buying more of this stuff that's going up. Uh-uh, remember, reversion to the mean. So you're selling your winners as you're supposed to do. So rebalancing helps you make the right decisions. Sell on the top and then you buy your losers to get back to that 80-20 mix for me. Maybe you're a 60-40 person, 60% 60 stocks, 40% bond. You figure out your asset allocation, you figure out how often to rebalance, and then you go live your life. So by the way, it's not like this has to be done a lot. Some people may do it once a year. I do it by threshold, i.e. 10%. Until my stock portfolio hits 90%, I don't care. If it's at 84, 86, 88, I don't know. I let the stocks do whatever they're gonna do. They hit 90, I rebalance. How often do I do that? Maybe twice a decade, decade. I personally spend less than five minutes a year on my portfolio, and so can you. So when I said this is simple, it is. And when I say I spend time, I'm just looking, saying, well, that's interesting. Do I need to rebalance? No. And then I go live my life. And then maybe I'll go in a few months later and look again. And that's it. In other words, people like to complicate this issue and it doesn't have to be complicated. The industry would like you to think it's complicated so you will run to them and their helpers. So invest in retirement accounts, it's a no-brainer. If you can put money away in 401ks and 403bs, you should do that. Put money in pre-tax. If you're a higher income person, put money in a Roth 401k. If you're a lower income person, if that Roth is offered to you. Own a Roth IRA outside the workplace at a place like Vanguard into index funds. Again, owning index funds within retirement accounts, it's a no brainer. As we become educated, we just gotta find them. Problem is, there's a lot of crappy retirement plans out there. So if you don't have good options in your retirement plan, raise hell. Why don't we have low cost index funds in here? I've had many people in this class who've done that and they've changed their retirement plans. They've gotten low cost index funds in there or they changed the whole plan. They went from some crappy plan run by principal, prudential, whoever, and now it's run by Vanguard. So it's doable. And a lot of times you just gotta get enough people to raise a little hell and say, why are we getting the raw end of the stick? Select those index funds. And again, you might consider a low cost target date fund. Here's the caveat. So a target date fund, it owns stocks and bonds all over the world, right? It rebalances for you over time, becoming more conservative. Nothing wrong with target date funds, except there are expensive target date funds and there are inexpensive target date funds. So you wanna make sure you own a target date fund if you wanna go that route that owns index funds. In other words, it owns a total stock market index fund, a total international stock index fund, a total bond market index fund. So how do you know? Well, I can tell you, if your fees are under 0.2, i.e. 0.15 or 0.10, then they own index funds, because managed funds can't work that cheaply. But if that target date fund has fees of 0 0.75, 0 0.9, they're not index funds. And if they are, they're incredibly expensive. They're most likely managed funds contained within this target date fund. When I say target date fund, it could be a life cycle fund. And by the way, if you choose this route, you may only need one. You know, I, I work with people on retirement plans and they may have like eight different funds within their 401k. And one of them is this. Well, if you're gonna go the target date fund, you need one, that's it. You don't need other funds for the most part. That one diversifies you all over the world. Just make sure you get the right one. Sir. Cost is expense ratio. The expense ratio is how a mutual fund makes its money. You want a low expense ratio for that investment. A target, 2060 would be the year 2060. 
If you choose a 2060 fund, you're gonna have a lot more stocks in that fund because it's gonna gradually go, to go back to bonds, but not until that point. So a 2020 fund is gonna have a lot more bonds, it's gonna be a lot more conservatively invested. So the bigger the number, the more the stocks. And that's what that target date basically means. Very, very similar with life cycle funds as well. Exactly. It will gradually become more conservative as it reaches that target date. And then, if different ones have different rules, I'll tell you the ones at Vanguard, once they reach the target date, so let's say you own a 2030 fund. When you hit 2030, half of it's a day. And then over the next seven years, it's gonna keep going down in stocks until you stop at 30% stocks. So seven years after the target date, in this case, 2037, it will stop at 30% stocks, 70% bonds, and it will stay there for as long as you own the bond fund or that target date fund. But again, that's how Vanguard does their target date funds. Every company is gonna do them slightly different based on how they wanna do business. So start small and expand. Start with a total stock market index fund. So when you're starting investing, again, I wish somebody would have told me this. It would have been so simple. Just own the entire market, own the entire index, and then you might wanna consider adding a bond index fund, either a total bond, which is intermediate bonds, or a short-term bond, for a little less volatility. So again, when you're young, you wanna own mainly stocks. As you get older, start to add a little more bonds maybe. It reduces volatility. The highs will not be as high, but the lows will not be as low either. Because those kind of bonds, the ones at Vanguard, they're high quality bonds. High quality government, corporate bonds. Those are the kind of bonds that money goes to when stock markets go down. And those are the kind of bond funds you want. You don't want high yield bond funds. Anybody, what's a high yield bond fund? Junk, junk bonds, that's right, junk. What, what do you mean by junk, Finley? I mean they may not pay, they may go default. But you see, the industry learned long ago. Uh, I don't think people are gonna buy junk bonds, so let's see, oh, we'll call them high yield. And guess what, they sell quite well. Because in people's minds, I like high yield. Well, yeah, do you understand you own junk bonds? Do you understand you're taking a lot more risk with that kind of bond fund than that kind of bond fund? So. Make sure you know what you own. And then gradually you add an international stock index fund for further diversification. So those three funds there, total US, total international, and a US quality bond fund, for a lot of people, that can suffice. If you wanted to stop with those three, you'd be just fine. But you can expand on that. You can own a real estate index fund, stock in commercial real estate, and you can own a small cap value index fund. That type of asset class is returned about a 15% return over time versus the total stock market return of 10%. So you can add them, you don't have to, but they can add diversification and maybe slightly higher returns over time. We'll talk about them more in detail in the weeks to come. But don't get too cute, don't get too cute. You wanna own mostly the entire market. U.S. international, and you just want to feed those accounts, and feed those accounts, and as John Bogle would say, stay the course. Markets zooming up, you're level-headed. Markets zooming down, you're level-headed. You just keep feeding those accounts. Here's an example that I think you really want to emblazon in your brain. One example of somebody paying 3% a year in fees. One example of somebody paying 0.07, their portfolio cost, which is my portfolio cost. Who has a portfolio cost less than that in here? Anybody? Come on, somebody's got to beat me. Yeah? What you got? 0.04, that's my man, that's what I'm talking about. So, in this case, they're paying 3% a year in fees, paying 0.07, that's what the fees end up with over that time period, 30 years with $100,000. And that's the difference. Over half a million dollars 
is going to someone else instead of you. Simply because we weren't focused on the fees. There was a study done recently, 72% of people didn't think they were paying anything for their retirement funds within their 401k. And folks, these people don't work for free. There's no Mother Teresa's running managed funds. So it's really important to identify your fees to get them as low as possible so you end up with most of the return. It's that simple. It really is. Focus on this issue as you start to go forward. Consider Vanguard. So you're gonna pay no loads, right? They have no salespeople. There's no Vanguard salesman out there that's gonna to try to get you in Vanguard funds. So you bypass salespeople, you go straight to Vanguard online to invest your money. You pay ultra low fees in those index funds. You have many options, you have many types of index funds to select from. And you can transfer high cost funds there if you have them within your portfolio now outside of retirement or when you retire, you can move your 401k to a place like Vanguard into say an IRA. So it's a good, good time to talk about Vanguard. People ask me, well, what makes them so good? Well, it goes back to 1975. John Bogle started Vanguard, started the first index fund with the basic idea that we're gonna build a company and create investments that serve the investor over the company. It was a hell of a concept. And Wall Street didn't like it very much. They called it Bogle's Folly, and it was slow to get going. People were like, well, what you want? But gradually, it created more interest, and people became more educated. And then the research came in showing just how badly index funds were beating managed funds. And what Bogle did when he created this not-for-profit investment company, as more money came in, the fees go down for the investor. Bonuses don't get bigger for the Vanguard big shots, but you and I, the investors, our fees continue to go down as the amount of money has come in. And now that Vanguard has over $5 trillion under management, those fees are incredibly low. Just like that young man paying 0 .04 for the total stock market index fund. It was all created by one guy in 1975. And now, the whole industry out there is trying to compete with Vanguard, the one they used to make fun of, but now they've lost so much money to, they're trying to compete with low-cost index funds, places like Schwab and Fidelity and others. Some recommended funds. So, by the way, you have your sheets. If anybody wants this PowerPoint, send me an email. I'll send you the PowerPoint if you want to review it yourself on your own time. But these are recommended stock funds at Vanguard. That total stock market index fund or 500 index fund own entire market. The 500 is 75% of the market. So 15% is mid-sized companies. 10% is about small companies. That's why I prefer the total stock market index fund. It owns the entire publicly traded US economy. Total international stock, 80% of it is developed countries, 20% is emerging, which is basically what it looks like outside the US borders. If you wanna own them specifically as individual stock funds, you can do that. There's that REIT index fund, real estate, stock in commercial real estate in large cities. And then that small cap value index fund or large cap value index fund, which have historically done better than growth funds. Again, right? The, the mind plays tricks with us. We think, I wanna have a growth fund. No, you don't. <laughs> growth funds have underperformed over time. And there's a lot of behavioral finance behind it. We'll talk about that in future weeks. Recommended money market and bond funds. So that first one up there, prime money market. It's cash. Paying 2.49 right now, compounded, so about 2.5%. Money that is being earned by you that you can access whenever you want, but it's in cash. So the question I would have for any of you is, what is your cash earning? So if the answer is squat, 
Well, I'll consider the prime money market. You can access it whenever you need it. It's your money. It's the same as account. Two business days, you can move it right back into your checking account for an emergency or a big ticket purchase, but you're making two and a half percent. Otherwise, your money is sitting in a bank or a credit union earning 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Who's making money off it? I'll help you out. The bank, right? They're lending it out at four, five, six, seven percent while they pay you 0 0.2. So I recommend you make money off your money, not someone else. And then a list of bond funds down there. You got a short-term bond, so very low risk. Total bond, they're all high quality bonds. You got international bonds, intermediate term tax exempt for really high income people outside of retirement. And then inflation protected securities fund, which is good to hold inside a retirement account, which guarantees you a bond fund that's gonna stay up with inflation. So all good options but you want to fit them to your particular situation. And we'll talk about this more in the coming weeks. So buying real estate with great care. So a lot of people think of a personal home as a good investment. Uh, it's not. <laughs> uh, the real estate industry has been telling us that for a long time. Your, your personal home is a bad investment after cost. It's a place to live. It's a place to raise a family. Enjoy it. But don't think of your personal home as an investment. When you consider all the cost that goes into that investment, which you should, if you're gonna call it an investment, it's a bad investment. So just think of it as a place to live and raise your family. Leverage is not always your friend. A lot of people learned that, especially in 2008. Rental property, it can be a good investment. We'll talk about that in the coming weeks, but you wanna be careful. I would tell you most people should not be doing rental property. They're dabbling in it and they really quite don't know what they're doing. Myself included. I would not be good with rental properties. First of all, I'd be paying somebody to fix the stuff because I wouldn't fix it. I'd break stuff, I don't fix stuff. And of course, consider those publicly traded real estate funds. Stock in commercial real estate that has returned higher returns than your normal small family home that you're renting out. And the cost is incredibly low. 0.12, 12 basis points per year to own stock in large commercial properties all over the world. Taxes, defer taxes as best you can, whether that's in a Roth account or a traditional account. In other words, you wanna see about your income, decide whether you should have money in traditional or Roth. Your income should help you decide that if you have choices. Let's say you have a Roth option within your retirement plan at work. For some people with moderate income, say under 60,000, you'd be better off putting money in the Roth than the traditional. The tax benefit's gonna be better later than it would be now. Investing in a Roth IRA. So you can have a Roth 403B, Roth 401K, and a Roth IRA. Two separate types of accounts. Roth IRA is awesome. Everyone should own one for the most part. Put money in. All that money you put in, the contributions, you can pull out anytime you want. No penalties, no taxes. It's just the earnings that you have to hold in there for a things will be tax-free one day when you pull them out. All of them. You could have a very large retirement account, and as you pull it out, None of it's taxed at the federal or state level. And if you have money outside of retirement, you wanna be as tax efficient as you can. You want low turnover index funds within non-retirement accounts, like a normal brokerage account. We'll talk about this in more detail. I know taxes can be challenging, but it's important to understand that we not only wanna be cost efficient, we wanna be tax efficient with our portfolio. Harness those emotions, we've talked about these. Knowledge can reduce that fear. Self-awareness, kind of helps with overconfidence, right? Self-awareness that says, okay, Finley, you're not as smart as you think you are. Just get the market return. Don't try to outdo others. Don't let that greed gene take over. I need to make more, more, more. I'm gonna take all kinds of risks so I can make don't do that, don't, don't let that happen. Greed is your enemy when it comes to investing your money. 
and beware of bubbles and herd behavior. We'll talk about that when it comes to the crooks and this big man, smart man theory that we, we just follow certain trends because that's what everybody's doing. Well, everyone may get slaughtered. You don't want to be one of them. Avoid those crooks. The next Madoff and Enron could be out there. So here's a good rule of thumb. If you don't know who that is, start doing your research. You want to know who Bernie Madoff is, we'll be talking about him, and you want to know who Enron is. It, it shows you what a crook looks like, behaves like. Enron gives you an idea of how you cannot really necessarily trust an individual company. Enron was the seventh largest company in the world, and in a few short days, it was bankrupt because it was run by a bunch of crooks. So when we put our money in the individual stock, we're taking a hell of a lot of risk, and we may not even realize it until it's too late. So guaranteed high returns are a red flag, right? Somebody said, hey, I guarantee you a 12% return. Get the hell out of there. Nobody can guarantee that kind of, nobody, nobody. So by knowing how crooks do their work, how they do business, will help you avoid many of the, the worst decisions that many people have made. And I mean decisions that can just cripple you. See, part of this is not just doing well for yourself, it's avoiding the mistakes. And there's just so much out there that needs to be avoided. So be skeptical of that next big thing. Right? There's always a big thing coming. You know, it was Bitcoin a while back. You know, I don't know. It could be AI now. It could be, you know, there's always somebody, pay, oh, oh, this is going to change everything. Eh, maybe, maybe not. And be careful of this, the great man. You know, that's how Bernie Madoff got people. Listen, you don't want to, you just give Bernie your money and, and he'll make money. Don't, don't ask him how he does it. It's very, very dangerous. Might want to listen to this guy. So when the greatest investor of our time tells us how to invest our money, we should listen. Period. Period. And if you have people in your life, spouse, local, yokel, financial advisor, somebody who's, ah, okay. If you want to listen to somebody like that over Warren Buffett, you go right ahead. But he's the person we should be listening to. Now, we shouldn't try to be Warren Buffett. Okay, there's only one Warren Buffett. He is the greatest investor of our time. What we should be doing as average investors is listening to his advice because he knows. He is looking out for us, and all we have to do is follow that advice. And that's the kind of advice that John Bogle has been giving since 1975. Kind of comes down to, do you want to be the gambler or the casino? Who goes to the casino? Okay. I don't see too many hands up. Okay. So, on occasion, some people go to the casino. Who's got the odds in their favor? Silly. Silly question. Right? Of course, it's the casino. Could the gambler get the jackpot? Yeah. Is it likely? No. We know this, right? We all know this. So, when it comes to this game of investing... The casino is, is owning the market. It's owning the index. Put the odds in your favor. Don't gamble. Yeah, you can gamble. You, can, you pick some managed fund or individual stock that could beat the market, but the odds are so much not in your favor. Why would you do that? And again, I believe a lot of people do it because they just don't know any better. They've been influenced by other people, advisors, commercials, whatever, and they don't actually know the numbers. So be the casino. And in the end, you will end up with the money that's going to serve your needs instead of serving someone else's needs. So what are you paying? So this is your homework. Some of you, this is going to be real easy because some of you have already made this transformation. How many people have taken their money and basically just transferred over to Vanguard into low cost index fund. Look at those hands, look around. Yes. Now, 
I don't know. Are, are you guys like financial gurus? Ann, are you a financial guru? <laughs> okay. And yet, she did it. Now, how much stress does your, por I'm picking on Annie, how much stress does your portfolio cause you on a monthly basis, let's say? Yeah. How much do you have to do? You do a lot of stuff? <laughs> and she calls me to talk about, do we need to rebalance, right? And that's it. Now, she may look on occasion, but that's it. Could be entertaining or not. The point is, you don't have to be a financial guru. Young, middle-aged, older, it doesn't matter. This works. It works if you're willing to work it and take the time to educate yourself and put yourself in a better position. I promise you. So now is the time to educate yourself on what you own. Do you own class A, class B, class C share? What does that mean? Well, there's, there's a loads. So your mutual fund, look at your statement. Look at something online. If you see an A or a B or a C after it, yeah, you probably pay a load. Class A is a load up front. Class B is in the rear. Class C is while you own it. Now, where does that load? Well, the load goes to the salesman. It doesn't do anything for your investment. Absolutely nothing. You should never, ever, ever, ever pay a load under any circumstance, period. What's your expense ratio? Right, so now look inside that mutual fund, if you have mutual funds, what are you paying? What is the expense ratio for that particular mutual fund? You wanna know that. And what is the expense ratio for the other mutual funds? And combined, what is the average expense ratio within your entire portfolio? And I know I just scared some of you, like, oh my God, I'm like, well, well start digging. Because you can find out it's there uh, it can be a little harder with 401ks, but let's say you have money outside of retirement or Roth, IRA, or non-retirement. Take the five-letter symbol, type it into Google. You'll see a Morningstar clip come up. Hit on that. It's going to show you your load, your expense ratio. It's going to show you details about that mutual fund. Dig until you get the answers. What about an advisor fee? Are you paying an advisor fee? Because a lot of times people say, yeah, I'm, I'm paying 1%. Well, you're paying more than that, right? If the advisor's getting one and the expense ratio for the investments that you're in is say one and a quarter, you're paying two and a quarter percent a year. And I think we've identified that's not a good way to play this game. Not for you, it is for him. So understand all the fees, all the costs that come with whatever is going on within your portfolio. And taxes. So many advisors, they really don't pay that much of attention to taxes. You should. What is your turnover rate within your mutual funds held outside of retirement account? So a turnover rate, how much is being bought and sold within that mutual fund? You want a turnover rate that's single digits, like three, four, five percent. There are many mutual funds that have turnover rates of 100%, 150, I've even seen turnover rates of over 1,000%, meaning everything that was owned at the beginning of the year has been sold 10 times over. And all that buying and selling, you incur a lot of short-term capital gains or losses, which is very bad for your tax situation while the advisor isn't really paying much attention at all. So you wanna know your turnover rate because you do not want short-term capital gains. And again, we'll talk more about taxes as the weeks go on. Figure out your situation. A lot of times, you know, when you're setting out on a trip, well, you gotta know where you start. You gotta know, this is where I'm at, and okay, I wanna go there. How do I get there? Well, the next eight weeks, I'll show you. I'll show you the path, but it takes time first to figure out where you are. So it is about knowledge. It's about gathering the information so you can really make an informed decision. That's what this is about. You can learn as much as you want. List of books up there. Uh, my second book, What Colors the Sky, is a book on investing. It's worth taking the time to understand this game of investing. If you read that book, if you've already read it, I 
consider reading it again. Read that book while you're taking this class. This class and that book will make more sense together. If you don't read my book, you can read one of those others that I have up here. They will help you as well. But be careful, some books are more advanced than others. What I try to do with my books, I write books for the average person, kind of just getting going, trying to figure things out. Glossary in the back, because there's a lot of terminology. You gotta figure out some of these words like negative correlations and modern portfolio theory and the efficient market. Yeah, but as you learn the language, you can start to piece it together. Because what can happen is, and hopefully you'll see this throughout these next eight weeks, you know, it's like, I don't know, I don't know. And then there comes some moments like, uh, ha, I got it, Finley, I get it. You, you connect those dots in one moment in time where you actually understand what the hell you're doing with your investments. And that's a wonderful day. Give you a moment to read that. We can change, folks. At any time in our life, we can change. You can teach an old dog new tricks. You can teach a young dog new tricks too. We can learn, we can act on what we know, and we can keep adding as we go along. I encourage you to be open to the idea that you can change your life with this information. Build on what you can. So you can go to my website, learn as much as you want, right? My cards are up here, feel free to take a card. Under my website, you can go into the menu, there's videos on investing, there's videos on all kinds of information that may help you. Start reading, get a book, start reading, add that information to what you're learning in here. If you want to, sign up for the Financial Happiness Academy, which is an online classroom. If you can't make all these classes, that may be able to help you. These videos will be on that Academy website. At the end of the day, believe in yourself. Believe that you can do this. Even if there's a part of you that thinks, eh, I don't know, because I, I was there. You know, I read my first book. He said I could do it. I don't eh, know. I'm just a kid from Iowa. But he was right. I could do it, and you can do it. Because at the end of the day, you are the answer to your life. Your portfolio, yes, but your life. And what you do right now going forward is decisions that you are going to make. And those decisions are going to affect the rest, not just of your life, but the people around you. As I talk about this, you can build generations of financially educated people. You can help your kids, your grandkids, you can help your parents, your grandparents. You can help the people you love simply by helping yourself. So I'll finish tonight with a story as I always do. The name of this story is The Yacht. So once upon a time, a guy was looking for some financial guidance and he heard about this financial advisor and so he drives up in his uh, Honda Accord, about 10 years old, and he walks in the door, and man, this office is beautiful. And there's a guy behind a desk, and man, he is decked out. He looks good. I mean, he looks successful. So as soon as the guy walks in the door, the uh, financial advisor steps up and says, hey, how you doing? Can I help you? And of course, the guy says, sure, I, well, I'm, I'm looking for advice and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, oh yeah, no problem. I'm happy to help you. But I was just heading out the door to, uh, to go to the marina to check on my yacht. I need to look at a few things. Would you like to come with me, he says. So the guy says, uh, sure, sure. So they go out to the parking lot and they walk right past the 10-year-old Honda Accord and they get in this brand new BMW. That is beautiful. And as they're driving to the marina, he's telling them about the BMW, and it's a great car, it's beautiful. They get to the marina, 
They step out of the vehicle and whoa, this big ass yacht is right there in front of me. And uh, the future client is really impressed. And the advisor takes them on there, shows them the yacht, shows them all the beautiful things that go with it. And man, it's impressive. I mean, <laughs> and then the advisor says, hey, look over there. See that, that yacht there? That's my boss's yacht. And, you know, the, the guy is like, whoa, that's even bigger than this yacht. And the advisor says, look, look over there further. See that huge yacht? That's my boss's boss's yacht. One day, I'm going to have that. And the guy's like, wow, huge. And, and then all of a sudden, he, he kind of gets this weird look on his face. And the advisor sees this look, and he says, what, what's wrong? And this uh, future victim, I mean client, he says, uh, where are the yachts that belong to the clients? Where are the yachts that belong to the clients? And of course, uh, the advisor didn't quite know what to say to that. He quickly changed the subject and moved on. But, you know, that's kind of what this class is about. So you and I, whether or not you want a yacht, that's, that's up to you. I don't really want a yacht. But here's what I know. You and I, we can't afford to pay for other people's yachts, for other people's BMWs, for other people's fancy offices. And that's exactly what ends up happening. So at the end of the day, it's up to you to educate yourself and to make the right decisions so your financial house is in order for years and decades to come. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you, folks.